The Whistler. Story, One Dark Night. Though it was only eight o'clock in the evening, it was quite dark, and the houses along the tree-lined suburban street were quiet. In one house, a light could be seen burning brightly through the front windows of the house on the corner. Its illuminating rays reaching out across the front lawn to form finger-like shafts of light and shadow. And inside, Frank Jason paced the living room floor, moving with the nervous steps and motions of a sensitive animal contemplating danger. Frank Jason stopped his pacing on occasion and stared down at a large, dark stain in the center of the living room carpet. <laughs> so don't you, Frank? Stan talked for a long moment, your mind racing. And then you hurry to the front door. Hello, Frank. Not disturbing you, am I? Uh, no, no, Doris, of course not. Come in. You seem nervous. Not worried about a next-door neighbor dropping in, are you? No, no, no. I saw your light on. I thought I'd drop in. Your ever-loving wife and I had a date to go shopping in the morning, but... I'm glad you stopped by, Doris. I I was about to phone you. Oh? Frank, what's the matter? Something wrong? It's about Cora. Do you have any idea where she could be? She's not home? No. I haven't seen her since this morning when I left for the office. You haven't? That's strange. What do you suppose... Did you see her today? Around ten this morning. We had a cup of coffee... That's when we planned to go shopping tomorrow. I came by to tell her I couldn't make it. I'm worried, Doris. Worried sick. I called everywhere. Wait I... a minute. Could she have gone to see her sister? I thought of it first thing. She does that often. Takes off without telling me. But she usually calls me when she gets there. And she hasn't? No. Did you call her sister's place? Yes. No answer. But she's probably gone out. She could have tried to reach you and you weren't here. I haven't left the house since I got back from the office. Oh, I'm sure Cora's all right. She just forgot to call. You know how she is. Yes, that's, that could be it, I suppose. I'll be up for a while. Let me know if you hear from her. Yeah, sure. And don't worry. I'm sure Cora's all right. Good night, Frank. Good night. Hello, operator. Give me the police department. Mr. Jason, you last saw your wife this morning when you left for the office? Yes, that's right, Lieutenant. But she didn't mention her plans for the day or the evening. No. What time did you get back from the office? Mm, around 3.30 or so, a, a bit earlier than usual. Oh? Any reason for that, Mr. Jason? Well, yes. I, I thought it would be nice if Cora and I drove out to the beach house for the weekend. The beach house? Oh, we have a little place at Shelton's Cove. Oh. Use it for summer vacation. Weekend. Yeah, I see. So you got here around 3.30. And there was no note, message of any kind? No. Hmm. Well, it's still early, only 8.30. You'll probably hear from her. It's not like her, Lieutenant. Not like her at all. Oh, she's left without telling you where she's going before. Yes, but she usually calls later. This time she hasn't called. I waited until 7.30 and then phoned her sister in Santa Barbara. There was no answer. I finally got through to her just before you got here, Lieutenant. And? Cora hadn't been there. And her sister hadn't heard from her. Something's happened to her. Something dreadful. I know it. I'll take it easy, Mr. Jason. There's no need to get excited. No need. Here, let me show you something, Lieutenant. Over here. Well? That small scatter rug on the carpet. Lift it up. Okay. Well, what's this? That stain wasn't there this morning, Lieutenant. Not it was the scatter rug. Somebody put it there to hide the stain in the carpet. 
It's still damp. I happened to notice it shortly before I called you. The rug doesn't belong here. We usually have it in front of the fireplace. I was curious. Went over to pick it up. And, well, that's when I saw the stain. Uh Uh-huh. Could... Could it be blood? Yeah. It could be, Mr. Jason. We'll check it. A kaleidoscope of thoughts and reactions go crisscrossing through your mind now, don't they, Frank? As you wait for the lieutenant for his men from the police lab to arrive, go about their intricate, methodical checkwork. You watch them for a while and then wander out to the kitchen. Discover that your hand is trembling as you light a cigarette. You're not thinking of the men in the living room, are you, Frank? Not at this moment, as you stare out the window in the darkness of the garden in black. And then your thoughts are interrupted by the appearance of the lieutenant at your side. Mr. Jason? Uh, Yes. I have the report. Is it? Yeah. Blood. Oh, I was afraid of that. Mm. Uh, This description of your wife, Mr. Jason... uh... Dark hair, 38 years old, 5 feet 4, weight approximately 118 pounds. Yes? Yeah. I'd like to have you come down to headquarters with me. Down to the morgue. The, the morgue? The body of a woman answering this general description was found in the bay several hours ago. You mean you think it might be? Yeah. And then again, it might not be. Well, Mr. Jason, do you feel up to it? Yes. Yes, of course. Now, here we are, Mr. Jason. Uh, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Mm. just a moment, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, sure. Here, would you like to sit down? No, no. I'll be all right. It's just... I I know, I know. Take it easy. Uh, all right, I... I guess I'm ready. Uh-huh. Let's get it over with. Well, Mr. J? No. That's not Cora. Thank heavens it's not Cora. Come on, Mr. Jason. Let's get a cup of coffee. Thanks, Lieutenant. I could use one. It all feels unreal to you, doesn't it, Frank? Your conversation with the police lieutenant, his lab man working in your living room, the visit to the morgue, all things that you read about in the papers but never quite pictured as happening to you. Yes, Frank. It's all like a dream, a haze of unfamiliar activity, of questions and answers and nervousness and cigarettes and cups of coffee held in a shaking hand. And then finally, with the lieutenant driving you home, your nerves begin to settle back into place. Reality returns almost simultaneously with the sound of the police car's front tire touching the curb in front of your own home. Home. Thanks, Lieutenant. You've been very kind. Not at all. You'll let me know if you hear anything. Oh, sure. Try and get a good night's rest, Mr. Jason. Yes. Good night. Hello, Frank. What? Oh, oh, gosh. Saw you leave in the police car a while ago. Yes, I, I called them about Cora. I'm afraid something has happened to her. Of course something's happened to her, Frank. What? She's dead, isn't she? And only the two of us know where she is. I... I don't understand. She's in your back garden where you buried her two hours ago. Right, darling? are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, 
We'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Boston, Massachusetts. No city in the United States is richer in historical associations than Boston, the tenth largest city of our country. The Declaration of Independence was proclaimed from the balcony of the old State House. Paul Revere saw the lantern shine from the old North Church before his famous ride that opened the Revolutionary War. The great New England poets had their homes here. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Julia Ward Howe, John Greenleaf Whittier, and writers like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Edgar Allan Poe. Today, Boston is the largest market of the shoe and leather industries in the world. It's also the largest wool market and the greatest fishing port in the United States. And they have the Boston Red Sox. It's the home of the Mother Church of Christian Science. And people all over the world know about Boston products. They buy $3 billion worth of them every year. It's no wonder that the people who call Boston their hometown are proud of their two nicknames. They call Boston the hub of the universe and the cradle of liberty. Thus has Boston taken its place in the building of America. And now back to The Whistler. The feeling of a nightmare returns quickly, doesn't it, Frank? In the first accusing words from Doris Martin, your next door neighbor. She saw you, didn't she? Saw you bury your wife, Cora, in the garden in back of your house. And now the dread secret has to be shared with you. Yes, Frank. The momentary safety you sensed as you said goodnight to the police lieutenant is gone. Wiped away. Even more shockingly because of the calm, assured serenity of the softly smiling, attractive young woman standing before you. You turn mechanically and move toward the house. And Doris Martin turns too, shadow-like and strangely a part of you now, as she follows you inside. You see, Frank, I came over late this afternoon to talk with Cora about the shopping trip we'd planned. The back door was open. I walked into the kitchen. The two of you were too busy arguing to hear me. Then, then you heard everything. Yes. The money you were talking about, the old lady's $35,000, that was Mrs. Faraday, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was Mrs. Faraday. Cora had been her secretary companion once. You had been Mrs. Faraday's lawyer. That's how you met. All right, Doris. There's no reason. The old lady has stashed the money somewhere in the house. And when she died, you and Cora took it. No one ever knew. She... She told you? No. I sort of added things up after overhearing your conversation this afternoon. Cora was all set to skip out with the money, wasn't she? Yes. If I hadn't come home early, surprised her. You surprised me, Frank. I never saw you in such a rage. And then when you picked up the letter opener... All right, Doris, all right! Hmm. You need a drink? No. What are you going to do, Doris? Do? Why, nothing, darling, nothing at all. I'll keep you a little secret. Will you, Doris? Of course. Providing, um... Providing I make it worth your while. Is that it? Mm-hmm. You won't find me greedy, Frank. I think you'll get along fine the two of us. <laughs> darling, darling, relax. It's only the doorbell. I'll get it. No, 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 wait. you better get out. The back way. But why? But it, it, it's late. And, well, it, it might not look right. Oh, don't be silly. Look, I'm your next door neighbor. I just heard about Cora's disappearance. I'm her best friend. Yes, but Sit you... right where you are, Frank. It's the most natural thing in the world for me to be right here worrying with you. Oh, hello. Well, evening. Oh, say. Uh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see, let me see. Uh, uh, Doris, is that right? Right. <laughs> and you're Harry Evans, Cora's brother. That's right. Well, nice to see you, honey. Uh, the folks up? Uh, Frank is. Come in. Well, hiya, Frankie. How's the boy? Hello, Harry. How have you been? Oh, oh great, just great. I, uh... I thought you were out of town. Hell, I just got in. I'm on the way to San Diego. Saw a light on. Thought I'd stop by and see you kids play. <laughs> uh, where's Cora? She asleep? She, uh, she's not here. Oh? Uh-huh. Hey. Hey, fella, something wrong? Uh, you don't look so good. Yes, something is wrong, Harry. Cora has disappeared. Disappeared? Cora? She wasn't home when I got back from the office. I called everywhere. No one's seen her. Hey. 
Maybe she's been in an accident. Ed, you check the hospitals? The police are taking care of it, Harry. Hmm. Uh, look, uh, Frank, uh, uh, you and Cora... Yes? Uh, well, I mean, uh, well, you didn't have a quarrel, did you? No, of course not. Well, and she might have gone up to Santa Barbara. I hope you... she's not there. Hmm. And you, you don't have... Well, you don't have any idea where she might have... No. Oh, I don't like this, Frank. I don't like it at all. Sit down, Harry. I was about to fix a drink for Frank. No, no, uh, don't trouble, Doris. No Frank. trouble. How about you, Harry? No, yeah, yeah, I could go for a drink. Uh, plain water. Plain water it is. Yeah. Well, I don't know what to make of this, Frank. You? Not like Cora to take off like that. Not to let you know where she is. I don't mind telling you, Harry, I'm worried. I'm worried sick. Yeah, sure, sure. I know how you feel. I wish there was something I could do. What can we do? Nothing. Nothing, I guess. Just sit and wait. That's all. Just sit and wait. Harry's sudden appearance at the house is something to wonder and worry about, isn't it, Frank? Yes. You haven't seen or heard from him in weeks. And yet tonight of all night, here he is, sitting in the easy chair across from you. I am curiously. Not saying much now. Sipping his drink slowly. A strange expression on his face. And your fears mount and your mind becomes more and more uneasy and restless as the minutes go by. Finally, Harry places the empty glass down on the end table. Well, I, I think I'll shove off. Uh, just let me know if you hear anything from Cora, huh? I, I, I'll be staying at the Ormond Hotel. Then, then you're not going on to San Diego? No, no, it can wait. I'll just stick around. Well, thanks for the drink. Good night, Harry. Nighty, Frank. I'll be seeing you. Good night, Harry. Well, you can relax now, darling. He's gone. No thanks to you. Why did you have to... Encourage him to stay? I just wanted to find out what was on his mind. You know, your dear brother-in-law is a big, fat liar. What? He said he got into town a couple of hours ago, didn't he? Yes. Really? It might interest you to know he was here in this house last night with Cora while you were out bowling. Here? Last night? That's right. I saw him leaving around ten. Now, why do you suppose he lied, Frank? I don't know. I can make a guess. Cora was always very fond of her little brother, Harry, wasn't she? Yes. So he dropped in last night, mentioned he was on his way to San Diego. This gives Cora an idea. She'll take the money, drive south with Harry. Maybe he takes her to the border. For services rendered, she cuts him in on the 35000 Well, what do you think? I think that's a very good guess, Doris. A very good guess. He probably arranged to meet somewhere this afternoon. Cora didn't show, so little Harry trots over here tonight to find out what's holding things up. Of course. He knows about that money, I'm sure of it. And now he's going to stick around. He means trouble, Frank. Real trouble. I think we'd better keep a close watch on him from now on. There's very little sleep for you that night, is there, Frank? You're certain Doris is right. Harry and Cora working together, running away, sharing the money. And now that Cora has disappeared, he must suspect that you had something to do with The following morning, as you wander into the kitchen... You happen to glance out the window and see someone moving about in the back garden through the trees. Someone near the, uh, there you bed. Yeah, morning, Frank. Oh, Harry. Yeah. You. Just dropped by to see if you'd heard anything from Cora. No. Not a word. Yeah. Well, I saw your bedroom curtains were drawn. I didn't want to disturb you. You wouldn't have. Oh, rough night, huh? Well, you get my sweet myself wondering about Cora. You know, where she could have gone to and why. Oh, uh, cigarette, Frank? Thanks, no. Haven't had breakfast. I, uh, I think I'll go back to the house. You coming? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, you fixed up your garden nice, Frank. Real nice. Well, I, I don't have too much time to work on it. Weekends, mostly. <laughs> well, still, you've done a nice job. I see you've changed the value beds. Ground and turned over. Uh, yes. Cora's idea. She likes Stanius. Uh-huh. Say, uh, say, isn't that your... Yeah, the phone. 
Yes. Yeah. That might be the police. Uh-huh. I hope there's some news. Hello. Get rid of him, Frank. Um, just a moment. Yeah, what is it, Frank? Um, it's not the police. It's it's my office. I uh, have to go in. Oh, oh. Well, I'll be shoving you off. Have some business to take care of downtown. I'll be back at the hotel around 6 tonight if you want to get in touch. Oh, all right, Harry. So long. I'll be seeing you. Mm. Doris, I'll be over. What did he want? I said I'll be over. Why you get so excited? We're not discussing things over the phone. It's too risky. But who... You heard me, Doris. All right. So what did Harry want? He was asking about Cora. He noticed the flower bed I turned over. I think he suspects. Oh, don't be ridiculous. How could he? I don't know, but he suspects, I tell you. I see. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know, Doris. I, I don't know. I think the beach cottage is the perfect place for it, Frank. The perfect place for what? For Harry's little, um... Accident. Don't you remember what happened out there less than a year ago? You mean the fire, the explosion? That's right. The old-fashioned lamp, Frank. Hanging on a pulley from the ceiling. The explosion it caused. That was an accident. Only this time, it'll be on purpose. Yeah, but how could we get Harry out there? I'll call him at the hotel tonight. Tell him we, that is the neighbors, are worried about you. We think you've gone out to the cottage. Cora's disappearance has grieved you so. We're a little afraid of what you might do that... Uh, someone should be with you. Yes. Yes, I see. He gets out there, finds the cottage dark, lights the lamp. Our troubles are over, Frank. With the coming of night, you're strangely calm, aren't you, Frank? Sharing Dara's confidence that the plan will work. Yes. Because it must work. You find that your car has a low tire, so you borrow Doris's car and drive out to the beach and park a short distance from the cottage. Go the rest of the way on foot. It doesn't take you long for what you have to do. Set the booby trap for Harry. And a few minutes later, you put in a call to Doris. Yes, Frank. I, um, I talked to our friend at the hotel. He'll be leaving for the cottage in another quarter of an hour. Good. It's, um, all set for him. I'm heading back to town now. Oh, Frank. Yes? After you get back and put my car away... Will you call me? Sure, Doris. I'll call him. It's a few minutes past seven when you return to your house. Harry will be leaving his hotel shortly. And then the short drive to the cottage. And it will be all over. Back home, you reach for the phone to call Doris when... Evening, Mr. Jason. Oh, Lieutenant. Uh, come in. I thought I'd drop by. Been in the neighborhood all afternoon, checking shops, stores. Well, then, there's been no news of corn? Haven't turned up a lead yet. However, I put in a call to headquarters a few minutes ago. It seems they got word from a service station attendant out at the beach. What? Yeah. I think she saw a light at your beach cottage earlier tonight. Could have been a reflection of a car passing on the road, though. He's not sure. Oh, he must have been mistaken. Yeah. Still, if you'd let me have the key, I'd like to run out there and have a look. Mm. No? Yeah. They'll have a squad car pick me up. No. Be... What? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll drive you out there, Lieutenant. Oh. Well, I don't really? want to put you to... Really? It's, it's no trouble, and I'd like to go. Now, please. Okay. I'll call headquarters. Let them know where I'll be. I'll get my car out of the garage. You glance nervously at your watch as you start out of the house to the garage. You reach in your pocket for your car key. And then remember you left them in your car. You've got to stall the lieutenant off, don't you, Frank? Yes. Harry is probably just leaving his hotel now, and it wouldn't do if you and the lieutenant reached the cottage before he did. Delay, Frank. Five minutes or so. That's all you need. You reach your car, bend down and unscrew the tire valve on the low tire. A few minutes later, the lieutenant joins you. 
Something wrong, Mr. Jason? Oh, I'm afraid so. It's a flat tire. Uh-oh. Maybe I had better call a squad car. No, no, no. Don't bother. It won't take us five minutes to change the tire. Then we'll drive out to the cottage. Okay. I guess a few minutes one way or another won't make much difference. The time we need to change a flat tire is important, isn't it, Frank? Yes. Because it will delay the police lieutenant from reaching the beach cottage before your brother-in-law, Harry Evans, does. Before the accident that will take his life and free you of Harry's threat. As you reach inside the car and take the key from the ignition switch, you'll hear your phone ringing inside the house. You'll hand your car keys to the lieutenant and hurry up the driveway to answer your phone. But you reach the phone too late. The wire is dead. And a moment later... Doris. Frank, why didn't you call me or answer the phone? Lieutenant showed up. Now, look, Doris, he's out of the car now. Wants me to go out to the cottage with him. I'm trying to stall him until I'm certain Harry gets there. He won't, Frank. Harry is dead. What? He didn't fall for our little gag. Instead of going out to the cottage, he went straight to your backyard. Started digging. Doris, did he? No. I got behind him with a shovel. You were right, Frank, he knew. I found Cora's earring in his pocket. He must have found it near the flower bed this morning. Doris, where is he? What did you do? What else? We had to get him out of there. I dragged him into your garage. The keys to your car were in the ignition, so I put Harry in the trunk compartment. The trunk compartment? The spare tire is in there. The lieutenant will find the body. (laughs) I have found the body, Mr. Jason. And the two murderers, too. Quite a chummy arrangement, you two neighbors. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Les Tremaine, Alice Reinhardt, Lawrence Dobkin, and Eddie Marr. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This evening's story was by Adrian John Doe. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is George Walsh speaking and reminding you to listen again next week for another strange tale by The Whistler. Radio and Television Service.